Hi folks, Dr. Travis McMacken here. Welcome or welcome back as the case may be. Thank you for choosing to spend a bit of your day with me. I hope that I can at least help you to think some interesting thoughts. I'll be back with you in a moment after the music ends. Well, today I feel like talking about the Reformation, and specifically, I want to highlight the contributions of women to the Reformation. Although they're traditionally much less of a focus in recounting the Reformation story, those events would not have occurred if it had not been for the courageous women of deep conviction working tirelessly and far too often thanklessly in the background, and sometimes the foreground too. Now, I have to stress that I know much more about some of these figures than others, and indeed I know very little about some of them, and there's lots of other names that I don't know anything about, but hopefully collecting some of their names here will spur you on to learn more about them uh, than I have been able to do so far. And that said, I want to give uh, credit here to one of my former professors, Dr. Elsie McKee, for teaching me about uh, one of the figures that I'm going to touch on today, Katharina Schutzzell. Uh, she taught me about her fairly early in my education, and I'm grateful for that. I've been able to integrate um, some of that perspective into my understanding of the Reformation for a long time now. Um, McKee published a uh, very fine book on Zell that I highly recommend, so I hope that you'll go track that down. But I want to start off uh, a little more... Uh, a little closer to the center of the Reformation, or at least uh, uh, perceptions of the Reformation, I'm going to talk about Katharina von Bora, otherwise known as Katie Luther. So Katharina von Bora is perhaps the most well-known of the figures that I'm going to be talking about today. She was born to a landed family and was sent to a Benedictine cloister for her education at five years of age, and she moved to live there at nine. She somehow heard about the Reformation and its theology and decided that the cloister was not for her. So von Bora made her escape with some friends by hiding in a herring fish delivery cart. Now, Luther helped arrange the escape, and the nuns headed for Wittenberg. Von Bora rejected a number of different marriage proposals before finally accepting Luther's, and she became invaluable and indispensable in Luther's work. Their relationship seems to have been very affectionate, and Luther wrote letters to her constantly when his work took him away from Wittenberg, and many of these letters contain certain off-color, lascivious jokes, which, as far as I've seen, Von Bora pretended not to have read. Uh, one of the ones that I find most entertaining is one year Luther gives uh, Katie a new field for her birthday, and he's bought this field, uh, and it used to be the site of a pig market. And so he addresses Katie in the letters as Madam of the Pig Market. Uh, but what you need to know is that uh, in that time and place, pig market was another name for a brothel. And Madame uh, functioned in the same way as it does today, as the, the older woman who runs the brothel. So he's calling her Madame of the Pig Market. Anyway, so great was Luther's confidence in his wife that he named her the executor of his will, and that was very unusual at the time. Luther died uh, before the interdict, after the defeat of the Schmalkaldic League in 1547, so uh, Luther dies before that, but von Bora lived to see the apparent destruction of everything that she and her husband had worked for, and she actually died from complications from a traffic accident uh, in December of 1552. So, moving on to uh, our next uh, f figure here, that's Anna Reinhardt. Now, Anna Reinhardt was already a widow with three kids when she met Ulrich Zwingli. And she wasn't Zwingli's first close encounter with a woman either. Zwingli kept at least one mistress early in his uh, pre-reforming career, uh, but it was not uncommon for priests at that time to have common law wives, so that wasn't anything particularly remarkable then. Anyway, Anna and Ulrich were married in practice in 1522 and then publicly in 1524 when the official status of the Reformation in Zurich caught up with them. In any case, Anna's son from her first marriage, Gerald, was perhaps the one who first caught Zwingli's attention. Zwingli quickly recognized the boy's scholarly talents and gave him private lessons and then sent him to the university in Basel. 
In 1523, Zwingli gave Gerald the present of a treatise on, quote, the upbringing and education of youth in good manners and Christian discipline, end quote, which is perhaps my favorite thing that Zwingli ever wrote. In any case, Gerald seems to have been what brought Ulrich and Anna together. We can imagine that Anna was attracted or thankful to Ulrich, or perhaps even felt obligated to him, for the interest that he took in her son. Reports suggest that she was struggling to support her family and was happy for the help. So she and Ulrich had four children together in the approximately seven years that they were publicly married, before Ulrich fell in the Second Battle of Capel in 1531. They seemed to have a happy marriage, and Anna took an active role in supporting Ulrich's work. All the leading figures of Zurich's Reformation praised her, and after Ulrich died, Anna and her youngest children lived with Zwingli's successor, Heinrich Bullinger, and Bullinger's wife was also named Anna, coincidentally. So staying in Switzerland, but moving over a little bit geographically, uh, next on my list is Idolette de Bure. And those who know me even a little bit know that I have a major soft spot for Calvin, and that translates into a ton of respect for Idolette because she had the unenviable task of trying to manage him. But she'd had practice. Her first husband was John Storter, with whom she had two children before he died. John and Idolette were members of the French congregation in Strasbourg that Calvin pastored during his time there. They had Anabaptist leanings, from which Calvin cured them. Anyway, John died at just about the time Calvin started looking for a wife. He found himself a citizen of Strasbourg with a salary for the first time in his life and wanted somebody to manage his household. His household at that time included several students boarding with him. We have some of Calvin's letters to friends describing the sort of woman that he was looking for, and Bernard Cotre, in uh, one of my absolute favorite books to, about Calvin, paraphrases these letters in the form of a personal ad, or we might say a Tinder profile today, and this is what Cotre puts together, quote, Preacher of the gospel seeks chaste woman for caregiving and possibly more, only serious women wanted, end quote. I bring this up only to make this point. Idolette was the woman who answered that ad. And Calvin's best friend, William Farrell, uh, was shocked that Idolette was, and this is a quote from uh, Farrell, quote, actually pretty. Calvin and Idolette were happily married, even if their marriage wasn't happy. These were hard years for Calvin's work in Geneva, and they both suffered from chronic illness. And they lost a number of children in various stages of pregnancy. After Idolette died, John cared for his stepchildren with fatherly affection and later remembered them in his will. Idolette and John were married for about nine years before she died in 1549. John never remarried, and having read his letters, my view is that was because he had absolutely no interest in another woman trying to take Idolette's place. And on top of that, he had his brother with him acting as his secretary and running his household, so he didn't have that kind of material need for a wife either. So moving on from Idolette, uh, the next figure that I have on my list is Wibrandus Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt grabs the whole previous relationship motif that's been developing through Anna Reinhardt and Idolette de Bure and takes it to an entirely different level. Hers is one of the more interesting personal stories that I've encountered from the Reformation period. She was married four times, and each of her husbands was a Reformation-minded scholar. Her first husband was Ludwig Keller, otherwise known as Celarius, and he lived in Basel, and it was an important reformer. Her second husband was Johannes Ocum Johannes Ecolampadius, also based in Basel. Now, Ecolampadius was an important first-generation reformer who argued the Swiss case with Zwingli at the Marburg Colloquy in 1529 against Luther and Melanchthon. Now, Rosenblatt's third husband was Wolfgang Capito, who was one of the principal reformers in Strasbourg. But then Capito also died, and she married her fourth and final husband, Martin Butzer, also of Strasbourg, and John Calvin's mentor. She outlived Bootser by about 15 years and died of the plague in 1564. It's staggering when one thinks of the momentous contributions to the Reformation that Rosenblatt's husbands made, and it isn't a great stretch of the imagination to think that much, if not all of that, would have not have been possible without the labor she invested in their lives and ministries. And I wish I had the time and expertise necessary to elaborate more fully the contributions that these and other women made to the Reformation, but I feel safe in asserting that the Reformation would have looked very different, if indeed it could have still occurred, without their contributions. Karl Marx teaches us that ideas are always located in particular social and material contexts, and these women provided some of the most vital social and material contexts for the Reformation. 
Perhaps the next hundred years of Reformation scholarship might focus on elucidating this legacy and ascertaining the extent to which the Reformation itself honored or betrayed its most vital supporters. But let's move on now uh, to talk not about more of the uh, women of the Reformation in terms of wives of the principal reformers, but let's talk about some women who contributed to the Reformation movement directly through teaching and writing. And the first of these women I'd like to discuss is Argula von Grumbach. Von Grumbach was the Reformation's first female writer. She became active in the 1520s, publishing poetry and defenses of figures like Luther and Melanchthon. Von Grumbach also corresponded with Luther and met him in person in 1530. She attracted the most attention, however, when she wrote in protest to the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria. This is an interesting story. Protestant preaching was forbidden in Bavaria, and the university arrested a student named Arsacius Seehofer for breaking this ordinance. They forced him to recant and then exiled him. This sort of thing happened with some regularity at the time, as you can imagine, but this particular incident caught von Grumbach's attention and she, to use today's language, created a hashtag for it and the whole thing went viral. Her 1523 public, lecture to the uni- uh, public letter to the university, in which she excoriated them on the basis of scripture and with absolutely cutting logic, went through 14 editions in two months. Von Grumbach was married twice, for anyone who might wonder, but neither of her husbands was nearly as historically interesting or important as her. Next, Olympia Fulvia Murata. Murata was from a family deeply steeped in Renaissance humanist learning and was herself an accomplished classicist. She was selected as the tutor for a young noblewoman associated with the court in her hometown of Ferrara. This should ring bells for those who know Calvin's biography. You see, King Louis XII had a daughter, Renée of France. Louis XII was succeeded by Francis I, who married Renée off to the Duke of Ferrara. Renée set up her court as a haven for French evangelical sympathizers. Calvin visited her, and they corresponded over the course of years. So Murata's location and education primed her quite nicely for reformational engagement. I've seen some suggestions that Murata lectured, in relative private, I believe, on Cicero while still quite young. She married a physician who was attached to military campaigns, and some rather quick movements seem to have led to the loss of some or many of her writings. She died in Heidelberg in 1555, and a collection of her letters and other writings were published posthumously. Now we come to Katharina Schutzel, who I mentioned earlier on. Katharina Schutz married Matthew Zell, one of the leading early preachers of the Reformation in Strasbourg, and they got married in 1523. Bootser performed the ceremony. As the wife of an important Reformation minister, Katharina provided the sort of material support that one finds from von Bora, Reinhardt, de Bure, or Rosenblatt. However, she did more than that. She published. Quite a bit, actually. And some of, it found it there, some of these writings found their way to Luther, whom she seems to have met in person at some point. Schutz's most important contribution through writing, at least to my mind, was on the subject of clerical marriage. She and Matthew were one of the first Reformation pastor couples, getting married before von Bora and Luther and before the marriage between Reinhardt and Zwingli was made public. As you can imagine, such innovation attracted negative attention. Many different rumors swirled about the couple. So, she published an apology against those rumors in September of 1524. The authorities at Strasbourg were mortified and immediately confiscated all the copies they could find and forbid her from having more printed. It's a good read, though, and I recommend it to you. We hear about some of the rumors, for instance. Some of them are what you would expect, that she seduced Matthew somehow, whether with sexuality or riches or beauty, and related to that, the rumor that Matthew was filled with lust that needed sating. But there are rumors that perhaps we wouldn't expect at first, like the one about Matthew cheating on her, or the one about Matthew beating her so much that she ran away from him, or the one about Matthew hanging himself for shame at having married her. She refutes all these, of course, and asserts that the only reason they married was out of a sense of calling to pave the way for the truth of the gospel to be demonstrated through clerical marriage. Quite a couple of romantics, it seems. My favorite part in this text, however, is when she's writing against a Roman theologian and explaining to him why he's wrong. Then she comes to one of his treatises in Latin, and she doesn't know Latin. So she says, and I'm paraphrasing, If you translate your treatise into German so I can read it, I'll be happy to work through it and use scripture to show you where and how you're wrong. 
As I said earlier, I wish I knew more about these women, and I plan to learn more. Schutz is already a part of the Reformation class that I teach, and I'm going to try to find a way to include Murata and von Grumbach as well the next time around. And there are a number of other important women who contributed to the Reformation, and whom I know at least a little about but haven't been able to discuss here. And of course, there are still more that I don't know anything about. Uh, some of you may know the name Roland Bainton. He wrote a really popular biography of Luther called Here I Stand. It's a couple generations of Luther scholarship ago, uh, but you still see it in used bookstores and on the web and all kinds of places. But back in the 1970s, he published a set of books uh, on women of the Reformation, focusing on different countries. I believe there's three volumes. And I'm hoping to dive into that, and I hope you'll track it down and do so as well. But more importantly, track down von Grumbach, Marada, and Schutz's writings and read those. And follow the links in the description if you want to access a written version of this material. So that's all for today on Women of the Reformation. You've been listening to the McCracken Cast. I am and hopefully will remain Dr. Travis McMacken. I do all the production work myself, in case you couldn't tell. But the music is by my son, Connor. Until next time, think interesting thoughts. Thank you.